Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to get started with approaches. So at this point, I assume you're feeling fairly confident as far as ADF, as well as VOR, as well as GPS. I certainly would not be uh, trying to tackle these until you're feeling relatively comfortable following different sorts of courses and everything like that. Today's video is not going to involve any flying, which I apologize for. And uh, there's actually quite a few videos online that do some good detail here, but for those of you guys who like to kind of see the way I do things, here we are. So what is an approach plate? Well, an approach plate is what's going to give us the information we are required to use in order to safely fly an instrument or procedure. Remember, an instrument procedure is just what's going to enable us to get from the arrival, which we've flown earlier and seen a previous video on, all the way down onto the ground itself. Now, if you were thinking about arrivals and approaches, remember departure procedures are just that in reverse because they're designed to get us off the ground into the air and onto, of course, the en route system. So what are we looking at when we're looking at an approach plate? By the way, these approach plates are all borrowed right out of a free book you can get from the FAA. This is the FAA 8083. You can look this up on Google. It tells you everything you need to know in way better detail than I could ever hope in a million years to do. So anyway, with that out of the way, let's do it to it. First things first, when you get an approach plate, make sure it's the approach plate to the airport that you are expecting it to be. So in this case, you're going to get the location up at the tippy top, and you're of course going to get what type of approach it is, as well as what airport it is. In the United States, it gets a little complicated because you're going to have a different code than you are if you're going to be flying international. A really common question I get is people say, hey, how do you get those approach plates for international targets? Well, uh, if you actually just go online real quick and did something like EJL, ILS approach, and did add PDF to it, or something along those lines, you'd be amazed how good other people are actually providing these approach plates around the world. Again, Jeppesen's one of the major companies, but it can literally give you these fancy pants kinds. Now, don't worry too much. These approach plates are exactly the same sets of information, regardless of where you actually get them from. So don't panic or anything along those lines. It's going to be a little bit different depending on where you are. So anyway, let's pop back to the ones I'm most familiar with. So what do we need to know? First of all, what type of approach it is. This is an instrument landing system that is a combination of localized or glide slope. That's a good thing. If we're going to be using an ILS, of course, we need to know what frequency we're on. The frequency is always going to be the most important thing in the top left corner. In this case, it's going to be 109.3. or It's going to give us our approach course. If we're doing a manual uh, HSI, for example, or VOR, this is the number you're going to dial in for your course. It's going to give you your landing distance. It's going to give you your touchstone zone, as well as your elevation. Down here, it'll give you any important notes. In this particular case, this is really, really important. It's a converging approach. In this particular case, that simply means you're going to be coming out of both directions at the same time. That's exciting. It's going to give you the type of runway lighting. Again, this is for identification purposes to make sure you land it at the right runway. On the right, it's going to give you what you need to do to execute a missed approach. In this case, we're going to do a right turn to 3,000 feet and then proceed direct to OOD Vortac and hold. In this case, uh, you can actually see it. It's over here. You'd have to know its frequency, which in this case would be uh, ah, it's covered, 112.8, and of course you'd proceed direct over here in the event that you lost, and you can see the little dashed line indicating the holding turn. The other things on here, it's going to give you your ATIS, which is great for weather, it's going to give you the approach controller, tower frequencies, ground controls, everything you need to know all in one place. On the left hand and right hand side, it's going to tell you when this is valid. Remember this book was written a few years ago, so it's a little out of date here, as well as this little diagram down here. This diagram is what's going to tell you what our minimums are for altitude. In this particular case, you can see it's 620 feet, which is 600 feet above the ground level. Being important that you don't confuse height, which is this number, with altitude, which is this number. I'm sorry, this number would be altitude, this number would be height. Got it. Over on this side, it gives you this entire approach procedure from a side perspective, and it allows you to correspond directly to how high you need to be for different procedures along this particular line. So in this particular case, if we were doing the Modena approach, we'd be coming from Modena straight to any of these three positions. Once we hit this and intersect the localizer, we'd follow it straight down onto the ground. In a sideways perspective, if we're proceeding direct to this wine intersection, we'd be at an altitude of 4,000 feet. This little line right here simply would tell us that we'd have to be at or above 4,000 feet. Again, follow what our traffic control says. So what else do we need to see in here? Well, let's take a look real quickly. We have our heading that we're going to be following. We have our frequencies. We have our radials. And we have anything we would need to know, to know as far as procedure turns. Now, this example is not great because it doesn't have any built-in course reversals. We'll have to take a look at that in the next plate. 
Scrolling down, here's another example of an ILS approach. Again, everything looks about the same. All the signals are exactly what you saw before. The missed approach is so far away, they had to put it as an inset. Sometimes there's a second missed approach at a different airport. Again, just follow the instructions it gives you perfectly, just like it says. And again, this is another converging runway because this one's a lot of fun. Coming down here, we have a totally different type of approach. This is a VOR runway six approach. A VOR has no vertical information, but everything is exactly like it was before. Our critical VOR DME information is in the top left corner. We know how much room we have. We have all of our usual frequencies. And of course, you can see that this particular VOR frequency, this VOR station, is at the airport you're flying towards, which makes our lives a little bit simpler. So scooting down a little bit more, this is a VOR DME approach. This means you need both of these pieces of equipment in order to be successful. It's actually pretty cool. All you're going to be doing is you're going to be proceeding right to this point right here that's lessive, which is going to take you all the way down along this trail. Now, what makes a VOR approach super tricky, and we'll talk about it when we do individual approaches, is you have no vertical information. Now, this approach plate has something new on it. If you go about halfway down, you're going to notice there's this little teeny tiny cross, and they highlight it for us as FAF. That's final approach fix. What that simply does is that says the moment you cross this particular position, in this case, fly over the top of the VOR station, you need to start timing how long it's going to take before you've missed the airport itself. Now, some approach plates actually have a diagram in the bottom that actually walk you through what different speeds are, but it's more important that you can figure this out for your individual aircraft. Let's take a look at an NDB approach. Uh, now, this is getting a little absurd. Anybody who took a look at our NDB video knows that from NDBs, you have no information as far as what course you're on. So this one is a lot of fun. This is actually the one we'll fly. The way we do it is we're gonna come down here, do a course reversal, which is what this nasty little barber pole thing looks like, and then we're gonna land. This is actually a really, really slick approach, and we'll take a look at it later on. Here's another example of an NDB or GPS. I know you're sitting there going, what, you can have a both? The answer is yes. You can actually GPS to fly any of these routes. However, this was the original intention for this particular route. And you can see right here, we have our nice little fix, the final approach fix located right here. It's also conveniently our initial approach fix. And you have an NDB, but we can actually fly this using either one of these two tools. Now, this is going to be an interesting one to actually fly. I'll scoot down a little bit more. Some airports have what they call localizer-only approaches. A localizer-only approach is an ILS without the up and down. It's basically a super high-precision VOR approach, and usually the localizer is provided at the runway so that we can very, very accurately do it. Now, what makes this one a little bit different than the ones we saw a minute ago is the fact that this one features an NDB as your final approach point. Now you're sitting there going, wow, this can get complicated. Not really. This simply means that when you're approaching this, when you cross the NDB, which means you have to have that tech on board, you're going to have to then go ahead and start your timer so that you know that you don't smack into the ground or cross the minimums. In this case, if you take a look at our minimums, they're actually pretty straightforward. They're going to be 500 feet, which is not too bad. Curling down here is another example of a localizer approach. This one, again, has this weird little donut thing. This is kind of interesting. What is up with that weird little donut? We'll get to that one in a minute. This one is super duper unique because it uses what they call a DME arc. What that simply means is when you approach, you approach at a constant distance to a point, and then you turn to land the aircraft. That is going to be an incredible approach. There's actually a very famous one of these down in South America we'll take a look at because this arc is like 17 miles. It's insanity. But it does allow you to land relatively safely. Now, if this had an ILS with this rotating, could you imagine how complicated this could be? Again, plan in advance. And another thing I should have mentioned a minute ago is what these IAFs are all talking about. Those are your initial points. So if they say, you know, fly the ILS via, you know, JODAB, they're referring to this being the first point when you go to dial in into your FMS or your device. An LDA, uh, this one I've actually flown in the real world because it's not too far from where I live. This particular one is an LDA. This is basically a localizer that's at a funky angle. And I can tell you, it is a really funky angle. If you actually look at the runway, we're kind of coming this way. The actual approach is this way. It's for runway two, as in 20 degrees, but the approach course is two degrees. So that's almost an 18 degree difference. Now, one thing that you've probably noticed a lot of as we've kind of scooted through these, taking a look at these, is you've noticed these weird little circly things. And I pointed one of those out a minute ago as well. You know, if I scroll down here, you notice there's a dashed one. When I scroll up here, you'll notice there's a solid black one. This is a course reversal or a procedure turn. What does that mean? That means that let's say I'm coming from up here in the top and I'm proceeding this way. 
To get into this lineup so that it can be ready to land this aircraft, I have to actually turn the plane around. You can't just come down here and go boop, 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 and then do one of these things. Unless, of course, air traffic control radar vectors you in, which is the greatest thing ever. You have to actually fly this weird little hold pattern in order to line yourself back up. But well, we're going to take a look at that in great detail in another day. Let's just say it gives a lot of people gray hair when learning to fly instruments. Take a look at another example. This is called a simplified direction facility. This is like an, a localizer, but it's even less precise. Notice again that they're giving them insanely high minimums on account of the fact that the altitude here is so high. Now, one thing I should have mentioned a minute ago is the fact that you basically have two different kinds of approaches. You have non-precision approaches, such as these localizer ones, and then you have precision approaches, which are things like your ILS. Now, it's worth noting that all of these different approaches have certain minimums on board, and if you have a situation where the weather is so bad, you may not be able to use this airport simply because the available approach is not actually visible. Now, I know you're sitting there going, this 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 is a pretty good collection of information here and it seems like this is going to take us forever to make a million videos for it will but um what about the gps you know i only saw one thing that's the gps well the reality there is we have these other kind of approaches called r nav approaches so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna go over sky vector real quick and i'm gonna just go pick a bradley because i know these ones pretty well and you're going to notice there's these R nav approaches. Let's go ahead and open up one of these real quick. And again, we'll go into more details. I just want you to be able to pull the information you need off of these quickly. So an R nav approach is a GPS. R nav, by the way, stands for random navigation. You have to have a working GPS to fly this. These approaches allow you to land an airplane without using radio navigation. This is a very, very different way. Notice the standard operations and all the information is just the same. Notice that visually it's about the same as well. I noticed a particular one has a no procedure turn if you go directly from Norwich, lucky us. There's no procedure turn here if you're coming directly from Hartford. But obviously, if you're up here coming from like Springfield, you would have to enter the special procedure turn to turn us around. All of these points, Homie and Hadux, don't physically exist. These are all intersections that were generated and then dialed into your GPS as references, essentially. Now, it's worth noting that these particular approaches can be flown as if they're precise approaches because your GPS, if it's set accurately enough, can actually provide you up and down guidance, giving you an insane new variety of approaches. Sometimes these plates at the very, very tippy top will have like an X or a Y or a Z. That just means it's a different variation of the same thing. Look through all of them and pick the one that makes most sense for you. Now, what's so cool about this is once you load this in the GPS, you can just hit the approach button and let it fly the entire approach for you, including altitude, which is really cool. You'd have to press the nav button if you wanted to do it just left and right. Another thing worth noting is you've got everybody's favorite little uh, final approach fix right here. This is normally when you start your timer and start seeing when you get close. And obviously you've got your minimums down here. You can see it's 200 feet above the ground or it's 371 feet as far as barometric pressure, assuming you set that correctly. So one more thing I want to show with these approaches. Let's go ahead and uh, steal one, one more approach. Let's go over here, let's scroll down to here. I wanna go see one thing real quickly, if, assuming I can find it fast enough, excellent. I was mentioning earlier that these plates sometimes have timing. They do. At the very, very, very bottom, a lot of times you'll see a little chart which will tell you your ground speed versus how long it takes to get from this X to the ground. So when you're doing these approaches, you're actually going to be sitting here and starting a timer when you cross this point. In this case, it's DME 6.9. In the moment that your timer runs out, if you haven't found the runway or you've gotten to your minimum altitude, you automatically know that it's time to go around because you will not be able to safely land the plane because you just simply could not find what you were looking for down on the ground. So again, that's something to kind of keep an eye out for. I usually tell people to make their own because you can just use basically like a Google Sheet or something to quickly do 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, so on, so on and so forth, and be able to calculate your own aircraft safely and quickly. Now, there's one more thing we're going to take a look at, and that's called a circling approach. Now, one thing you probably notice down here is uh, you notice that we have the SILS, we have a straight localizer approach, very different minimum altitudes. Obviously, if you're not getting up and down information, you're going to have a much, much, much wider range, I guess I would say. So let's go grab my RNAV approach one more time. And let's come down here to circling. A circling approach enables you to go very close to the airport and circle it trying to locate the ground and then doing a very aggressive approach down to it. This number here refers to the minimums as far as altitude. Again, minimums are the, if you cross this point and you haven't found the runway, you're probably gonna crash into something expensive or and, you know, a mountain or something along those lines. So that's actually a different approach and that's a very, very different piece that you're gonna be taking a look at. 
All right, hopefully this video kind of gets you thinking just a teeny tiny bit as far as what you're going to need to do as far as reading these goes. I highly recommend that you kind of poke around, familiarize yourself, go take a look at that book as well. Later on this week, we'll be seeing the individual approaches, starting with an ADF approach, which is definitely an involved process. But again, make sure you're feeling really, really comfortable just being able to find things like, again, approach courses, knowing if you have enough runway, knowing your frequencies, and being able to look at this before you even begin to try to fly this in the simulator. Enjoy.